Hello, for those of you just signing in, and welcome to today's APN webinar. Uh, I'm Hadar Suskind. I'm the president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now, and I am thrilled to be here and to have two such wonderful guests with us and to have uh, so many of you logging in for this conversation. Uh, so again, for, for the last time, I will say hello, welcome. Uh, I'm Hadar Suskind, the president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now. I'm really excited uh, for this conversation today. There is, as you, as you all know, a lot going on as it relates to our issues uh, in the political world, particularly we're seeing how the conversations and discussions around Israel-Palestine and relevant things are playing out in democratic primaries. You know, it's always been an important political issue, uh, but the way things have changed, the way things have developed um, over the past few years has been significant, but specifically in this last cycle, the news that's different and big is, of course, the creation of the, the APAC Super PAC and the impact that that is having on our elections. Um, I'm thrilled today to welcome our two guests. Uh, I'm going to introduce them both and then hand it over to you. So first and foremost, I will start with Ruth Messenger. Uh, I'm sure all of you know Ruth. She has been a leading voice and a leading figure in progressive Jewish circles and social justice circles. Uh, for many years now, a wonderful friend and mentor. Thank you, Ruth, for being with us today. Uh, and of course, our second guest, uh, the esteemed Mick Moore. Uh, Mick, of course, as, as you know, is the president and CEO of Moore and Associates. Um, but my favorite thing about Mick is that he is, of course, an APN board member. Um, and Mick and Ruth have co-authored a really important article, and we've just put it into the chat. So if you haven't had the chance to see it yet, you can see it there. Um, talking about you know, talking about APAC and democracy and talking about what's going on in our elections. What does this mean in the Jewish communal space? What does it mean in the political space? Um, and you know, what does it mean for, for us as people who care about this? So I, as you all know, can go on and on on this topic, but um, I'm not gonna do that because we've got our two great guests here. So I'm gonna hand it over to you two. And Mick, are you starting? Is that right? Yeah, um, I'll start Excellent. us off. Take uh, it away. Thank you so much, Adar uh, and APN, um, for the opportunity. Uh, we're excited to, to talk about this article. Um, I'm just going to briefly summarize it, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ruth to dig in on a couple points, and then I'll do the same. And then, Hadar, I think we'll come back to you and for some audience questions as well. So um, if you haven't read it yet, um, it's not that long. So uh, it'd be great uh, if everyone uh, could read it. But um, Ruth and I were feeling um, like it was important to call out something that we were seeing throughout this election cycle regarding um, uh, uh, several things that APAC and sort of APAC allies were doing um, that we thought were damaging to democracy. And so the basic thesis of our article um, is that uh, this was damaging democracy in three ways. The first is uh, engaging in unlimited spending um, in an effort to overwhelm um, what they consider to be unaligned candidates, uh, unaligned on Israel. Uh, the second is uh, supporting candidates who are opposed to democratic laws and norms. So this is um, widely reported. Uh, APAC has endorsed 109 of the sort of insurrectionist Republicans. Uh, and the third is seeking to, um, what we describe as limiting free speech um, when that speech is critical of Israel. Uh, and this manifests itself in a couple of ways, which we'll get into. Um, but that's the, that's the thesis of the article, and we try to sort of explore each of those three. Um, but Ruth, I, I want to start with you and maybe dig into one or two of those points, and then I'll circle back on the rest. Um, okay, for sure. So first of all, hello, everybody, and Hadar, thanks to you and to APN. Um, I want to start by saying that, um, you know, I spent 20 years in elected office, and I spend a lot of additional time doing politics and dabbling in elections, and I value democracy. I've worked overseas in a lot of different countries doing international human rights. That makes me value democracy more. And I think that our democracy is in general under threat. And I would add that democracy is, if we're going to be tribal for a minute, um, particularly important to Jews. If you look at a long history, we um, have had lots of trouble with authoritarian regimes and we've done well in democracies and we need democracies to protect um, our human rights along with that of other 
groups defined by faith or ethnicity or nationality or whatever. So having said that, I find the um, role that APAC has been playing, particularly in these elections, to be hugely troubling. I want to I want to take one other minute out and say, you know, let's be clear. They have a right to do what they want. Um, they have a right to urge their members to, for, to support certain candidates. They have a right to endorse candidates. They have a right to put money into campaigns. But when they do it secretly, and when they do it on a particular issue, and most importantly, the issue I want to pick up on, when they do it in ways that step all over democratic norms, it's deeply troubling. So the first thing that I think caught Mix and my attention, he mentioned very briefly, but looking at the Republican incumbents, who one presumes whose position I, they like on Israel, APAC sent re-election money to 109 Republican senators who thought January 6th was a walk in the park, who saw no threat to our democracy from the assault on the Capitol, um, who were, you know, basically supporting insurrection. And that's deeply troubling because if you can, as you know, and we see this going on still, there's a core of people now in this country encouraged by the former president who are trying to get elected and seek office in order to limit democracy if, the, if things don't go their way. So to support a large number of members of Congress who seem to me to be not interested in democracy was, was really deeply troubling. And then I'll just say one other thing, and then Mick will turn it to you and we'll keep going. But the second thing that Mick and I saw that was troubling was in race after race around the country, APAC would pick a candidate. Um, basically, uh, it appeared that they would pick a candidate they wanted to defeat, and then they would put a large amount of money into the opponent of that candidate. And some of that was done secretly, and some of that was done without mentioning issues. And the latest example of this, just to mention it, was in one of the crazily contested Democratic primary elections that were held this week in New York because somebody thought August 23rd was a good day for a Democratic primary. Uh, but in one of those, APAC announced after the race was over that they were proud to have put several hundred thousand dollars in to defeat one of the progressive candidates um, who she did not win. Um, but it's that kind of ex after the fact, and look what we did, and we're manipulating elections in in terms of one issue that I find deeply troubling and has thrown some candidates that I thought that I'm quite sure would have won their races without APAC's interference, um, particularly Donna Edwards, um, out, out of office. And it just, I find it troubling. And the last point I'll make, and then we'll go to Mick, is where large sums of money, and in this case, it's Jewish money, are put in through PACs, sometimes not public, to defeat a candidate, it is quite likely that the people who lost the race end up thinking less well of Jews, end up thinking that Jews only care about the Middle East, and end up thinking that um, Jews are willing to put secret money into campaigns in order to defeat candidates. That's very definitely the, not the reputation I want us to have across the United States or around the world. Mick. Okay. Mick, before we go back to you, let me jump in with, with something real quickly. Apologies. First of all, um, I haven't done this in a while, and I forgot the key part of my introduction, which is reminding everybody to please use the Q&A function. Uh, a few of you have done so already, but if you have questions that you want us to discuss, you can type them in there and we will get to as many of them as possible as we get to that part. I also just want to note, and maybe Mick, I'll actually throw this in as the first question too. Maybe you can clarify for people the difference between the super PACs, what we're seeing now, um, versus the more traditional PACs where somebody is giving directly uh, publicly to a candidate and what that distinction is about. Sure. Sure. Um... So, uh, so I'll start with a question because um, it's a good one, um, and I've, I've, uh, I didn't talk a lot about my background, but I've done work um, on political campaigns for a, a lot of years. And when I first started um, raising and spending money, uh, that was back in two thousand four, um, and the rules were extremely different back then. Um, there were a lot more restrictions on how you could raise money and how you could spend money, um, and uh, for the most part, um, if you were raising money, you were raising money within 
limitations that were set by law. Um, and a, a case in 2010 called Citizens United um, basically changed the law in a significant way and created sort of a new category of PAC called a super PAC. Um, and basically super PACs are allowed to raise unlimited money and spend unlimited money in almost unlimited ways. Um, so what typically happens is um, you know, you'll get usually a, a handful of very wealthy donors who will put significant sums of money into a super PAC. That super PAC has a particular mission and they can um, advocate for and against uh, candidates. That was again, it's behavior that used to be limited to, um, uh, to a much uh, smaller number of folks. Um, and they can spend as much money as they want, as long as they're technically not um, talking to the campaign that they're supporting. So um, what we tend to see is you'll have the campaign is spending money that was raised within limitations directly from individuals. And then side by side, you'll have a super PAC, which will come in with $5 million and put that largely into advertising, mailers, other forms of you know, um, uh, communication. So, um, so that's the universe. APAC, um, despite the name, as most people know, is not actually a PAC political action committee, um, but it was a lobby. It still is a lobby. Um, and they decided only this past cycle that they were going to create both what's called a hard money PAC. Um, a hard money PAC can give money directly to candidates, and those are uh, under limitations, and those amounts tend to be fairly small. And to create a super PAC, which they, um, I, I guess, tongue in cheek, I don't know, semi seriously uh, called uh, United Democracy um, Project. And, um, and that can take uh, literally million dollar checks um, from anyone it wants and then spend that money largely however it wants. So a lot of the money coming into APAC's super PAC um, comes from actually Republican donors. Um, and uh, this cycle, they have spent about $25 million just out of their super PAC. Um, and it has gone exclusively into Democratic primaries. Um, so basically what's happening is, right, <laughs> Republican millionaires and billionaires are putting huge sums of money into a PAC created by a PAC that claims to be pro-democracy in order to exclusively meddle in Democratic primaries. So it's a way for Republicans to influence which Democrats um, end up in office, um, which uh, we could spend time on why that's problematic. But that's, that's uh, as- uh, Let's as just posit that that's problematic. Yeah. It, is, it is problematic. And as Ruth said at the top, um, which I do think is worth underscoring, all of this is legal. Um, there are a lot of things that are legal and bad. Right, I would say this falls under that category. We've had a bunch of lawsuits from our uh, not awesome Supreme Court that have made um, spending in politics, um, uh, you know, sort of a free for all. Um, and that decision was bad for democracy. And the way in which that decision and the super PACs that have come out of it have played in the political space has been bad for democracy. So I think that's our our one of our central contentions. The the last one which I mentioned at the top, but we'll just come back to is specifically about how, um, and this one's a little trickier, I would say, but the ways in which both APAC and I would say other players in the Jewish world have essentially sought to limit um, the range of uh, acceptable speech around Israel. Um, and we've seen this um, both outside of the electoral process. So there's a series of attempts to uh, legislate um, against uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, movement, um, which uh, maybe it's worth going into what that is, or maybe it isn't. But in any case, hopefully folks know what BDS is. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, <laughs> um, but outside the electoral process has been an effort to legislate against it, basically, so that if you're a government contractor, you can be forced to um, state that you do not support um, BDS in order to get a government contract. Um, and this has been happening in state after state. Um, you also see it though in, in more um, uh, sort of informal ways in the political space. And um, uh, I'd say the first way that this is happening is um, our organizations and, and I would say the Jewish press has decided that um, it, any uh, commentary on BDS, right? Anyone's position on BDS is gonna get a ton of attention. Um, and so you see in race after race, um, if you have a candidate that makes any comment that 
um, could be are, uh, seen as even sympathetic to BDS or partial BDS or um, is critical of Israel or that right doesn't state exactly what the sort of uh, acceptable communal position is, um, there's going to be a ton of um, negative press attention and um, attacks uh, by Jewish communal leaders um, um, on, on that candidate. Um, and we've seen that and APAC is driving that, but it's not APAC alone. I'd say that's, that's broadly. I, I would just, I would just to underscore that um, what Mick and I were picking, one thing we picked up on particularly was a, a, a forum. Forums are always hard to get candidate views, especially when there are a lot of candidates. If you have six or eight candidates and they're being questioned as their position on a range of issues, and um, if you watch the forum, you would learn something about the candidates, never enough. But if you read about the forum in the Jewish press, you would only learn about their position on BDS. Now, it's not like that's an unimportant position for some voters, but this, these, this was a congressional forum. And where do people stand on um, legalizing same-sex marriage? Where do people stand on the fight against the Supreme Court decision in Roe? And I would point out, where do people stand on available funds for social um, service systems? We have a, a plethora, and they're magnificent, of Jewish organizations around the country that serve Jews and non-Jews, that meet the needs of the elderly, that meet the needs of children in distress, that provide foster care, that provide Meals on Wheels. I could go on and on. And you could watch a whole congressional forum in which neither the Jewish hosts of the forum, nor particularly the Jewish press covering the forum, tells you where any of those candidates stand on any of those issues that we know are important in the Jewish community. Yeah, and the, the impact of this is to, um, is to really uh, shape the political um, conversation in, uh, in really harmful ways. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing that we've seen is the, uh, is the use of um, uh, the label anti-Semite or uh, anti-Semitism to refer to either individuals that are um, not even supportive of BDS, but even sympathetic to people who support BDS. Um, and we've seen uh, occasions where, um, you know, Jews uh, are called self-hating Jews if this is a position they take or if they express sympathy. Um, and candidates for sure are very quickly labeled as anti-Semites. Um, and uh, this has a, an effect of narrowing, right, um, the kind of acceptable speech um, that we see and our community, uh, and again, APAC in the political space, but our community has a, a real hand in um, this as well. So I wanna pause there because I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but I think those are some of the key, um, key issues that we tried to raise in the piece and key concerns that we have um, coming out of this election cycle. Great, thank you both. So two, two quick things to note, one, you know, the two of you were just talking about how uh, views around BDS get people called anti-Semites. But again, looking at one of the key examples you guys wrote about in your article, the Andy Levin Haley Stevens race, you know, Andy Levin, who is a Jewish and a synagogue president, et cetera, and actually does not support BDS, but he does support, you know, reasonable um, policies vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine, was widely called not only anti-Israel, but an anti-Semite. So I think that use of the the frame of being anti-Israel and anti-Semitic and having those things be synonymous uh, extends broadly, unfortunately, in this space. Um, and then one just quick detail that I wanna note from the questions before we, we dig in. Uh, I think there was some misunderstanding about the uh, 109 Republican uh, representatives. So right. just to clarify, it's, it's representatives, not senators. All 109 of those are among the APAC endorsees. So somebody ha here asked if they were endorsed or just given money. The, the way this process works is um, APAC, like other organizations, has the traditional PAC, as Mick described it, and those candidates were endorsed and given money to them, to their campaigns. Um, the super PAC work, where we're talking about the unlimited funding coming in, again, as Mick said, has so far only come to play in the Democratic primaries. So those Republicans are endorsed. Those Republicans are getting money. There are there are others beyond the 109. I don't remember exactly what the total number was. It's 160 something maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of questions coming in. And I think one of the ones that is important, and you guys were, were just talking about this, is both in terms of people in the community and the candidates themselves, you know, 
they're watching this happen. Candidates are seeing not only people like Donna Edwards, but also Andy Levin and others, you know, losing their races and whether they're losing their race because of this or not and how big an impact, you know, the, the APAC money coming in has, I think is, is another piece. But I guess the first question I want to start with is, you know, and Ruth, you alluded to this, there's the likelihood that people are going to look at this um, unhappily, both in terms of what they think about the Jewish community, but as candidates and as people in the political space, you know, do we have the fear that this is going to shut people down, that this is going to make people hesitant to speak out on Israel issues, to, to stand up? And if so, what's our role on the progressive side of the community in addressing that? Who wants to start with that? Um, well, I'll say something and then maybe Mick will jump in. I, I will say something from the point of view of a candidate. You know, you spend your life, um, good candidates, that's what I want to say, um, uh, um, spend their lives trying to be clear where they stand on the issues and trying to get elected. And there's a whole process which money, packs, demonstrations in front of your house, things like that, can, can threaten the clarity of a candidate's position and sometimes can um, take away or sap energy from the, that candidate's moral courage and commitment to standing for what she or he believes in. So yeah, it's not fun to be out there. Um, and I do think that, again, part of what the donors to this these two PACs want is for candidates to tow a particular line um, on the Middle East that does not, in many of our, in many of our judgments allow for a full look at the issues of the Middle East, does not allow for people to say, you know, there's some other issues, there's some questions I have or whatever. Um, and yeah, I think candidates, uh, I'm big on pushing candidates to do risk-taking and moral courage, but I, and showing their moral courage, but I think this makes it harder. Yeah, and I, I mean, that, that's obviously the intention, right? Like the the folks who are putting this money in and, and spending it, they, they want not only do they want to defeat the people that they're up against, but they want to um, make it much more difficult for people like that to make the decision to run in the first place or to get the kind of support they would need in the first place. Because if you know that if you run candidate X, they're going to attract a $5 million spend against them, right? And then you have candidate Y, who's very similar, but is not going to attract a $5 million spend against them. Well, that's a pretty, you know, uh, significant political calculation, and that goes on all the time. I, the other thing that I think is important, we've only talked about congressional races, you know, what we've um, seen increasingly is that um, that these funds are, are moving into uh, state races. Um, and so you have um, a series of sort of state-based um, PACs that are basically aligned, um, that are putting uh, lots of money into uh, races where the candidates have absolutely no influence whatsoever on, uh, you know, on the Middle East or Israel Palestine or any of these issues. Um, and yet, um, you know, they are having to deal with hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in spending against them. Um, and, you know, I, it's, it's, it's made like city council races become like about Israel, right? Or a state assembly race become about Israel. Um, when that's not why this person is running for office, it's not what they've done with their life, um, and the the money has, you know, really perverted, um, you know, what that process is supposed to be about. Um, and uh, I think uh, to to an earlier point, like people see this, right? Um, voters see this, um, and it does, you know, I think have an impact on on people um, and how they perceive the community. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to make one point, and I, you know, again, I want to say I'm trying to make it really clear to people that that we don't have enough laws about limiting campaign contributions, but nobody's breaking the law here. But you know, when take two examples, when NRA or Planned Parenthood come out with a list of their candidates, well, this is who we've endorsed. I think I, and I think the entire general public says, well, okay, those are one issue organizations. They want to defend the right to bear arms on the one hand, and they want to defend a woman's right to choose on the other. And so if they endorse, I know where the candidate stands on that one issue, and that's fine. And I, I want to suggest, although I think APAC would reject this, that APAC is quite different. It has, it has a Middle East position, 
but it also has come, and maybe this isn't fair, but it's simply a fact, to represent uh, a piece of what and who the Jewish community is. And so again, if you're in a black district in, in Pittsburgh and you're eager to get your um, state representative to win a democratic primary and you discover that quote unquote, the Jews are raising $3 million to defeat her, then you come to see the Jews, if you're not Jewish, as a kind of single issue organization, um, again, not entirely APAC's fault, but is affecting the way people think and feel about the Jewish community. And that means we have more to do, some of which APN is doing, some of which many people on this call are doing to make it clear that we are a for sure, a complicated set of communities, but we have we have key issues, uh, key positions on many, many issues. And the one I want to just keep enforcing is I want us to have strong positions on democracy and on fairness and on inclusion. And these positions in these races keep going against that and on transparency. And that none of those are being respected. Yeah. And like you said, the transparency issue is not about APAC. That's a structural problem we have. I think, you know, one of the things, and again, this is right in the headline of the article you two wrote, the issue here is not disagreement about Israel-Palestine policy. That's existed, and it's existed in our political spending before. The issue is the question of democracy, and what is making this different is, again, APAC endorsing and supporting those 109 insurrectionist members who you know, did not support the peaceful transfer of power that is at the very, the very core of our democracy. And, you know, that issue of, is one issue, whether the NRA or Planned Parenthood or APAC, over everything else, including the literal existence of our democracy? And I think that's one of the core questions. You know, Ruth, I don't know if you picked Pittsburgh as your example, just sort of off the top of your head. Of course, there, there was the Summer Lee race. Right, she, she won, yeah. but she won by only 600 votes against right. $3 million of money that was put up to defeat her. Exactly. And so in this case, you know, it's one of the examples where she did come out and win. And there was, a, I, you know, I'm happy to say there was a lot of Jewish uh, individual, but also organizational, you know, active support on on her behalf there. Um, and so, you know, I know from being in touch with with her campaign, her people that at least in, in their case, they understand the breadth of the, the community and our different views. So uh, there's a question here from uh, one of our participants that's comes that's along these lines. It says, to what extent do you think the broad Jewish social justice sector should really take on the Israel-Palestine issue through that progressive lens and confront APAC stands, um, you know, as, as we take on other issues and it says here, gender, LGBTQ, et cetera. It says, and to what extent do you think the Jewish social justice sector should argue that we shouldn't let Israel dominate US electoral politics or something else? So are we doubling down and saying, yes, this is the core fight we as Jews are having in our politics? Are we trying to frame a different argument? What do you got? Yeah, uh, that is a good question. Um, it's asked by a former staff colleague of mine. So I was going to say, <laughs> really, Alana, thank you, Alana. I, so I look. I mean, I, I've been, you know, uh, attempting to answer this question um, in many of my roles that I've played in the Jewish community over many years. And we've all been working on that question for a while. We have. I will say, here's where I'm at right now. Um, so I think, like, what I've seen, and I, I mentioned this earlier, is that you you have like if you're a Jewish social justice organization or a Jew who cares about social justice um, on a wide range of issues and you want to support candidates that are aligned with you on healthcare and you know right. uh, climate and you know all these other issues, um, and then you back a candidate and then that candidate ends up spending like fifty percent of their time responding to attacks over you know. Uh, over the issue of Israel, not the issue that they are, you know, um, an expert in, not the reason they're running, and frankly, not the reason you're necessarily backing them, right? Um, this creates a dynamic where the most progressive, the boldest, you know, candidates on all these other issues um, become very difficult to elect because of this broader dynamic. So I think it's, it's impossible to avoid it entirely. And I think um, uh, prior to taking it on. I do also, though, think it would be a mistake for um, us to create uh, uh, 
an ecosystem where if you're a Jew who's not particularly interested in Israel-Palestine work or in the issue of Israel or just wants to be in a space where you can focus on the domestic issues or the international issues or whatever it is that you care about, that you also have those spaces to go to. So I think it's a it's a tricky dynamic, and I know organizations sort of are handling this, you know, in each in their own way, but I do think it is, we've gotten to a point in our politics where it's impossible to not recognize that this is a, such an important force in, uh, uh, in undermining progressive candidates' ability to get elected if they're facing this kind of, you know, um, spending. So I think it's something we have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, again, is different in this cycle, and the APAC PAC and Super PAC are part of the reason, but not, well, probably the largest part of it, is that, you know, again, Israel and spending around Israel has been there. There were the all of the local PACs that you mentioned before, they're local races, but they also all work on congressional races, um, and obviously, you know, J Street and others. Um, but the difference that I see now is that for almost every race, this is now an issue. So like you're saying, you know, there are the majority of candidates out there, uh, and certainly the majority of voters, not only is this not their top issue, it's not in their top 10 issues, right? It's not why they're running for Congress. It's not what they've done before. It's not, frankly, what they're really interested in when they get to Congress. And yet it has become a hot button issue that is unavoidable for any candidate. It doesn't matter you know, where you live, who your constituency is. You may literally not have a Jew in your district, and there are some districts like that in America. Um, and yet, you know, you are still uh, likely to be forced to choose between, you know, an APAC endorsement or a J Street endorsement, or whether that's literally or, you know, sort of figuratively, um, and forced to, it's not just that you have to have an opinion on this, because of course, if you're going to be in Congress, you should have an opinion on this, but forced to deal with it and forced to address this issue with a much larger percentage of your time and energy um, than, you know, than probably, frankly, makes sense for a lot of candidates out there. Can I, can I say one more quick thing, which is I, the, the reason why APAC made this decision, which was a big decision for them to become, to start to do direct candidate spending, um, is because they're losing right? Like, this is really a, a coming from, I mean, it feels like, you know, those of us who work in these races, like we're being overwhelmed, like they have a lot of power, all of which is true. But it's coming from a, a position of real weakness and, and real fear that they no longer have the, the kind of sway within the Democratic Party that they did traditionally, um, that there is increasingly a large constituency that thinks differently about this issue uh, than they do. And, um, and so I think, you know, this was done, you know, in a, in a sense out of desperation to sort of maintain, right, the sort of um, level of, uh, of influence that, you know, uh, they've traditionally held. And I, I think those of us who organize around progressive issues should see that as a good sign, um, you know, uh, for what we're doing, even if it means that we're now struggling with uh, a new dynamic. Agreed. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of commentators that have discussed that as well, that, you know, we can argue about exactly how much impact uh, is, is the APAC PAC and Super PAC having. There are those who, you know, have written things saying, well, we're, we're sort of giving them too much credit, right? That any of these races, whether it's Andy Levins or Donald Edwards or Summer Lee or others, that, you know, there are much deeper dynamics that determined what happened and that this was, you know, one, one impact, but not the. Um, but I think there are a lot of people that are looking at this strategy as ultimately uh, a mistake for APAC. Um, another question. And again, again, they're free to do a single issue. And I, in response to that question you asked about and a couple of other questions that I see, yes, it means that, that there should be more support for people who care about progressive options. There should be more support for J Street. There should be more education about the range of social justice concerns that Jews have always taken on and they're taking on in a, in a particularly dramatic way in the last decade or in the last couple of years. We, the burden is always on us to do a better job of educating, but this is an issue, the super PAC issue, the lack of transparency is a problem for the future of democracy. And it's going to show up on these issues. It's going to move, as, as each of you said a few minutes ago, these issues are moving into state races and city council races, by the way. 
where, you know, we used to joke when I was in the New York City Council that only in New York does the city council have a foreign policy. Because occasionally people would ask us to pass resolutions on Zimbabwe or uh, Palestinian human rights or whatever, but it can get, you know, you have candidates who are really concerned, let's say, about the problem in their state assembly district, and yet they discover that some money is dependent on what they what they say about BDS, what they say about the future of the Middle East, what they say about two-state solution. I mean, without naming names, I will tell you that someone I know to be a hugely responsible person engaged in Jewish and democratic politics told me that um, Andy was not supported. Andy Levin was not supported. I just want to be really clear. I'm about to state a non-fact. Told me that Andy Levin was not supported because he supported BDS. He does not support BDS. So the and this is somebody who was in the know. This is not somebody who like and and I had to go on the website and say, look, there are a lot of reasons why he lost. A lot of people have arguments about that, and a lot of reasons why some Jews didn't support him. But that's not one of. That's not a legitimate one. Right. It may be one of the reasons it's not true, but yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, uh, just a little anecdote, Ruth. It may have been once true that it was only in New York, but you know, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, and our county council is dealing with what is purportedly an anti-Semitism resolution, but is really all about Israel. And we're, you know, APN is working on this and others here in, in Maryland are working on this. So it's not only in New York anymore, that's for sure. Um, okay. One question I want to put out to the two of you because I think it, it's, you know, it's sort of a more 30,000 foot, but it's important. It says, how do we approach speaking to liberal democratic members of Congress who accept money from APAC but are not willing to denounce them, which makes sense if they're accepting the money. And, it, and then it does ask, and I'll just answer this part. It says, do these candidates have to agree to advocate against the two-state solution? So just a little note for everybody here, at least the first rounds of APAC endorsements that came out of Democrats, um, and APAC did not, say this, but they have since admitted it, it is true. They endorsed a whole range of people without asking them, without any process. And, you know, Ruth and Mick and I have all been involved in this work before and know that that is, you know, that's not how it works. If you're going to, if you're an organization and you're going to endorse a candidate, you talk to their staff, you talk to their campaign, you sit down with the candidate, you have a questionnaire, you go over, you know, are you aligned? You, you ask the questions, are there any specific things that they have to commit to in, in order to earn your endorsement? There's usually a deep, long process to that. And APAC came out and endorsed a range of candidates, including, you know, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, for example, who found out she had been endorsed by APAC on Twitter. Um, and, and it is not alone. And there were a lot of Democratic members who found out, you know, in a press release that they had been endorsed by APAC. Um, so again, that goes to, we've had a lot of discussions as to why they did that, whether they didn't think, you know, the normal process applied to them. To be perfectly honest, I think it shows tremendous hubris that they just figured everybody would be happy and excited to get an APAC endorsement. And I will say this, none of them denounced them. Um, and there were members of Congress who were not happy about it because they are those you know, liberal democratic members as described in the question, but they were not willing to publicly come out and say, no, no, I don't want your endorsement. So if it was hubris, they weren't necessarily <laughs> wrong. So anyway, uh, either you wanna speak to the, the question there. Yeah, the question was what sort of, what do you say to liberal democratic members of Congress that are still taking APEX endorsement? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure somebody's tracking this. I think the, you know, there, ever since J Street was founded um, back in, you know, 2008, um, you know, there has been a sort of push and pull in terms of, you know, who, whose endorsement would you take and whose endorsement, you know, like I, th those have been sort of the two polls, um, you know, in terms of federal, you know, races, um, congressional races. Um, and you've seen a, a steady shift um, of increasing numbers of Democratic candidates that are taking J Street's endorsement and then ones that are not being endorsed or not taking an APAC endorsement. Um, so I think there are, you know, trends that are moving in the right direction. I think there are some things that have happened. Um, I would point to, I think the two maybe most important ones are the fight over the, uh, the, uh, the Iran deal um, and the way in which that was politicized and the break that sort of happened there. And you saw, I think some 
Democrats uh, sort of moved away from APAC because of that. And then I, I think the, the decision to endorse the 109 insurrectionists is the second one, um, which, um, you know, uh, is helping Democrats see more clearly um, exactly what APAC stands for. And, you know, it's, it's visceral, right? Like the way Democratic, um, you know, liberal Democratic uh, members of Congress feel about the insurrection is really visceral. And I, I, my sense is, and Hadar, you would know this better since you're in regular communication on the Hill, but, but that felt like, you know, a real betrayal. Um, and I know folks that I, I identify as APAC supporters that have been openly critical of that move um, because they really do fear for our democracy. And it's like, you, you know, like if we, if we lose our democracy, like this stuff doesn't matter. <laughs> Right, like you know, the sort of gradations of one's position on this thing, like that has to be the most important issue. And if an organization is willing to say basically, like, ah, it's not that important, or we're we're, able, we're willing to overlook it, then it's I think makes people reconsider, you know, what the priorities are of that uh, organization, whether they want to be aligned with it. I mean, I would only add to that just just to pour pour more fuel on that argument. These insurrectionists, not one person, not any one person I could name, but keeping in power people who decided to ignore what I think legitimately history books will see as an unbelievable threat to the future of our democracy. Any one of those people is more likely than not to support the news people are being run for secretaries of state around the country who are saying that they're prepared to put in their own set of electors in 2024 if they don't like where their state goes. And so like 109 is a big number. I'm sorry, I didn't say Congress people before, but but we're, we're, APAC is helping to leave in power, um, not just people who took a position on January 6th that some of us find appalling, but people who by having taken that position seem to me to be more inclined to substitute their own will for the will of the people. Yeah, and you know, if, you, if you go down ahead. that list, you see, to be fair, not all, but some of the very worst members of Congress. Um, and I say very worst in the frame of democracy, in the frame of their, you know, some of their their active support and of what happened on January 6th and denial about it. Um, some of them, you know, all of them obviously, you know, not supporting the, uh, certification of the election and and continuing with uh, you know with those state and local races um yeah you know if there's an interesting I mean we're, we're talking a little bit about about the state and local you know again the APAC packs at least for the time being are uh, are focused on federal races but we are seeing you know we're seeing this become again like uh, a, an issue that plays in every race. It plays in every congressional race, no matter what your district is. And it does play in gubernatorial races and state house races and and all of these others in a way where it is, because of what we're seeing with the, the support of the insurrectionists, it is superseding other issues and they're they're putting it out there. And, you know, Mick, to what you were saying before about folks you know who are APAC supporters, I, I think this has been even more than the Iran deal, a breaking point for a lot of people. Because people who I know who were APAC supporters up to last year, for many of them, some of them are just you know very far right and that's their views, but for many of them, they still held on to what I think are frankly very antiquated views of you know APAC is the center, it's the true bipartisan voice that works with Democrats and Republicans. And we need we need somebody to hold that center that's not, you know, they, and again, I, I think that view has long not been true, but there was people who still held it. And, and this, I think, shattered that for many, many people. So, I mean, the next question I think I wanna throw out there is, again, what do you think um, we, and it's a, it's a big picture, we, including, including APN, but but all of us, you know, what do you think we should be doing in the community? I'm not talking about different political spending now, although get into that, to address this issue. I mean, what do, what do we do now? Well, so, you know, I was going to quote a few minutes ago uh, to pursue my argument on democracy. I was going to say that God bless the Washington Post, which about the time that uh, that former president got elected, adopted a new masthead slogan, democracy dies in darkness. 
And I think that that's part of what we're saying here. And it's an answer to your question, Hadar, with respect to um, APN and uh, um, J Street and many other organizations. We have a constant ongoing educational job to do. Um, let's forget state and local races for a minute, but including them of candidates who for a variety of reasons don't know don't know the Jewish community, don't know where the Jewish community stands. And again, with respect to APAC, they heard from APAC for a long time as like, we're bipartisan. This is the position we want you to hold. And they don't have, I mean, see many of your questions, questioners, I'm saying that there are a significant number of members of Congress, despite the efforts of some of you whom I love, who have not had much exposure to the complexity with how, of how many Jews see the Middle East situation see it as questions of human rights on both sides, see it as, question, as questions of settlement expansion, see it as, I mean, these are the things that probably everybody on this call knows and lives with and, and has some range of opinions on, and the Jewish community has a broader range of opinions on, but I will tell you from the, the many years of lobbying and advocacy I did with American Jewish World Service, that there are lots and lots of members of Congress who, because of the demography of their districts, don't have that many Jews in their districts, know that they have some Jews, and don't know the range of things that Jews care about broadly, and don't know that there's a serious range of views on the Middle East. That's, when you ask, what should we do? That's a pretty big challenge. Yeah, I, I would encourage folks, um, I've been doing a lot, a lot of my, my recent political work has been in, in New York um, locally um, through, uh, the Jewish vote and Jews for racial economic justice, which are both locally focused organizations. And you know, one of the things that that we've been doing is just organizing, right, and talking, you know, to to Jews who don't have millions of dollars to spend on PACs, but are in districts, you know, where these elections are taking place. Um, and you know, while the sort of headline story coming out of um, out of New York on this was was the congressional district ten, where you know, APAC secretly spent about four hundred thousand dollars against the leading progressive candidate, who, who seems to have narrowly lost um, by, I don't know, a thousand votes, fifteen hundred votes. Um, the fact is that the the there were many other races where there was an effort to demonize candidate progressive candidates around their views on Israel Palestine, uh, where those candidates won, um, um, including in Riverdale. Um, which, you know, we sort of go, go back a couple cycles and Jamal Bowman, um, you know, uh, took that seat from Elliot Engel. There was a lot of conversation and there was a lot of money, including from um, Democratic Majority for Israel, which is sort of another organization that plays uh, in this space as well. Um, opposing uh, Jamal, um, he won. He just won re-election by a huge amount, um, you know, uh, despite a lot of concern that, you know, he might be uh, uh, in trouble. Um, you had a state Senate uh, candidate uh, in the Riverdale district who won um, his seat against uh, formidable opposition, including doing quite well um, in Jewish areas. So I think organizing uh, at the local level is still uh, really key in demonstrating to these candidates that like it's not fatal, right, to take progressive positions on these issues if you're being forced to, to speak to them. Um, you can still win, um, and we can still elect, you know, really good candidates, uh, despite, you know, uh, the money coming in. So it, it's, you know, I, I advocate against, you know, for a new system of campaign finance, like, it'd be great to get a constitutional amendment that, you know, overturned Citizens United and, you know, some of the other problematic uh, laws that we have. But in the meantime, I think there's still a lot of work at the grassroots level that Jewish groups can do to make a real difference. Yeah, I mean, there's no question, and we, we stated it, you know, at the beginning, there's a much larger systematic American political problem that has nothing to do with APAC, nothing to do with Israel, um, and, you know, it desperately needs to be addressed. But within that context, we also have, have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, one piece that we've sort of touched on a little bit, um, you know, the, the issue of anti-Semitism. So for a long time, folks in the right uh, you know, on the right in our community 
have used accusations of anti-Semitism. And over the past few years, we all know there've been these very concerted efforts to conflate criticism of Israeli actions and policies, and certainly anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And, and APEC, frankly, has been at the forefront of, of that. They're, they're not alone, but they certainly have done so. Um, and so, you know, we see on the one hand questions of, well, gee, is this action going to, as sort of as Ruth was saying, perhaps spur anti-Semitism by people who see, you know, Jews influencing races to, you know, as they have been doing consistently oppose women of color, for example. On the other hand, you get things like yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, APAC tweeting out something about, you know, J Street's PAC, and J Street has a super PAC also, which is new this cycle, just got their largest donation ever, which was a million dollars from George Soros. And APAC immediately tweeted out, you know, George Soros is well known for his support of anti-Israel organizations. And, you know, it is widely, widely viewed right now that, you know, just literally the use of George Soros's name, right, is basically an anti-Semitic dog whistle at this point. And so you've got APAC on the one hand accusing people of being anti-Semites for maybe supporting BDS or supporting conditioning aid, for example, as APN does. Um, on the other hand, you've got them using George Soros as a boogeyman out there. How do, how do you think this elevation of the super PACs and Israel as a political issue is going to impact the question of anti-Semitism in this country? Just a small question. I mean, it's... Look, I mean, I think there's a few questions that are embedded within this, right? Um, I mean, we, we didn't name any names earlier, but like one of the people, I think we list this in the article that APAC endorses, Scott Perry, right? And Scott Perry, I, I would say, has like said openly anti-Semitic things and bought into, right, the sort of broader right-wing conspiracies that implicate Jews and globalists and, you know, all the code words for Jews. And, you know, and the, the you know, uh, the Republican Party has has a, a significant um, uh, uh, narrative that um, draws on anti-Semitic scopes. Like it's it's become central to um, I would say sort of core Republican narratives. Um, and you know the the more aligned APAC becomes with the Republican Party, the more it embraces those tropes. So it feels like the decision to, you know, um, uh, talk about George Soros uh, in this way, in an environment where this has become for conservatives and the sense in the Republican Party, a way to signal, right, that sort of Jews are controlling, uh, you know, our politics. Um, it feels like a, a just a, a more, a, another example of an explicit embrace of, of this sort of right wing uh, tropes. Um, and, you know, and maybe that will help people see more clearly, like what's going on that, like you said earlier, that Apex, um, uh, Apex um, perception as a bipartisan organization that sort of sits in the middle um, is, uh, if, it, if it were once true, it's, it's definitely no longer the case. Um, and, you know, I, I, and maybe there's a silver lining to that, right? Like, you know, it's not, APEC doesn't have to be one thing, right? Like it can be this new thing that it wants to be, but I think if it, it, if it is gonna be that, then folks need to see it clearly and should align themselves, you know, so, which means that I think increasingly Democrats shouldn't take their endorsement. Um, and, um, you know, and they, and the community should stop uh, pretending that this is, you know, a, an organization that's broadly representative of the community. Ruth? No, I'm, I mean, I look again, I would agree that, but a, I mean, the, the morphing of APAC is, which Mick described right up top, is worth repeating because they did a brave thing many years ago. They said, here we are, we're concerned about Israel's status in America. And we're going to um, lobby Republicans and Democrats, and we're interested in, in educating them in one position. And then it, usually it was taking a position that supported us in exchange for our endorsement. So now they've gone sloppy about that. They don't ask you permission, that, that your positions. That's pretty weird. But also they, they went about becoming, as Mick described earlier, all of a sudden a PAC and then a super PAC. And we have a different 
uh, not much of a different substantive agenda, except to sort of dig down, but a, but a fierce difference in style and approach. Um, we're simply trying to educate people about that. And as you said before, Hadar, educate members of Congress about that, because, you know, it was not, anyway, it, I think it's, and I want to iterate that because a couple people asked about this. It does not allow members of Congress or state legislatures or city councils to understand the complex dynamics of the Middle East. And I just want to say that Jews, you know, there's some Jews who would admit that they don't understand or like the dynamics of the Middle East, but by and large, Jews have some notion of what's going on there that is very often way advanced of what members of Congress think. I mean, I know this from having talked to members of Congress, when I was not there to lobby on Jewish issues per se, when I was there, I mean, well, just when I was there for American Jewish World Service, and I would say, we're bringing a bunch of rabbis into the congressperson's office to talk about the farm bill. And they would say, oh, yes, the foreign aid bill. Mm -hmm. And I would say, no, no, the farm bill, we we're working overseas, we're interested in the breadbasket of Ukraine or whatever. And they couldn't even, they just couldn't fathom that an organization with Jewish in the name and with rabbis in their office had an interest in anything other than the Mideast narrowly defined by APAC. And I want to say, as I've said a few times, you know, in some ways that's the APAC's early credit. But what they're doing now, which again, they have a legal right to do, but, but it's very sad to me that they're doing it in ways that are dramatically non-transparent and dramatically anti-democratic. Nick, you want to add to that or? No, uh, that was good. I know we're close to, to out of time. So I don't, do you have the last question for us? Close this out. Well, you know, there's, I mean, we've talked about so many different elements of this. I think ultimately, you know, the last, the last question for all of us again is what are we going to do about it? And what are we going to do about it organizationally and individually in educating our constituencies in working within the community to perhaps try to shift those those balances of power? Um, I guess I'm going to ask the two of you and make it's a little bit of a trick question for you since you're on the board. But for so I'm going to I'm going to start with with Ruth. But you know, Ruth, you have uh, been someone who's just who's demonstrated tremendous impact throughout. Your, your career on different levels. So I'll take the opportunity and ask you if there's one thing you think APN should be doing in this space, you know, relevant to this, what is it? What what, what can we do? And make a I mean, Sure, but I think it's I think it's sort of more of what you're doing. And you know, somebody gets to somebody who isn't the CEO or a board member gets to say, obviously you need more money to do this. But I think I think the the narrative story of the Middle East and of some of the current issues is as much less known than we tend to think it is. Not well enough known or clear in, on the part of everyone in the Jewish community, and even less well known on the part of le you know, legislators. If you are a candidate for, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna say non-Jewish, but it's not even, but if you're a non-Jewish candidate, as, as Mick was saying, for state senator, state assembly in Riverdale, it's like all of a sudden a little odd that you're expected to have a nuanced understanding of what people mean when they say, are you for BDS? Are you against BDS? Are you for a two-state solution? You know, and, and we all know, or I'll say I know candidates, and sometimes it's just an inclination to get a half-sentence phrase on it, you know, oh, here's my answer on that question, without going deep and without being encouraged to go deep. And so, you know, we have we have ongoing educational jobs. And by the way, we've seen this, if I just switch for a minute, we've seen this on the choice question, right? I don't know, 10 years ago, it was like you were either pro-choice or anti-choice. And now we've spent six years arguing from various perspectives as to when does, when does life begin and how strict the law should be. And if you are a legislator here, I'm not saying they're doing this, I'm disappointed that they're not, but theoretically, if you're a legislator, you need to dig down into this issue. Who's saying what? What are the issues? It's not, it's no longer can be cast as a simple issue because if you're not going to be able to get a majority to support a woman's right to choose, which is clearly what I support, then you need to understand the nuances of the bills and the and the proposals that are going to come across your desk that are increasingly complicated. You know, there's all this legislation now around the country that is like, you don't have to do anything about pro-choice because adoption is the answer. 
And the people who are doing it are telling like these little loving stories about adoption. And it's such a much more complicated issue in every regard. And so the burden is on legislators. And on, but here on US or at APN, I think the burden is sort of narratives that helps people understand some of what's going on. You know, some of the, Mick referred to Jay Fridge before, some of the stuff that Jay Fridge put out in the last couple of years explaining anti-Semitism and its connection to white nationalism and and it's therefore its connection to racism, I think moves some people in our community to say, oh, this is a complicated issue, not a simple one. And that's really important. And we need to keep doing that on every issue. And since we're near the end, I just want to say again, not that there is a Jewish position on any of these issues, but there's a vast universe of human pro-human rights, pro-social justice Jews who care tremendously about Israel and about the future of Israel and the future of Middle East politics, but they care about other things as well. And I want to know how hard they're going to push to support Biden on forgiving student loans and how hard they're going to push on getting the child tax credit back. And when we have forums that don't ask those questions, we're doing our community and the candidates both a disservice. Thank you, Ruth. Mick, closing words? Yeah, I just something we wrote in the piece that I think is, is appropriate here. Um, uh, towards the end of the article, we said um, that even more important than winning every fight is maintaining a fair system where people who disagree can contest for power again and again on a reasonably level playing field. Um, and I, I think, like, like we said, like we, we people are going to have different opinions. Like, there's, you know, there's always going to be a range of politics in the Jewish community that's totally fine. I would like to think that an area of agreement is that, like, uh, you know, uh, a thriving democracy is good for our community, uh, and that we can broadly see the value in that. Um, again, this sort of reasonable loving level playing field, uh, so we can contest for power. Um, and you know, that's for APN. I'd say yeah, that's true here in the United States. It's true in Israel too, right? And there's a common thread. You know, this is not just a, a, a you know a problem in the U.S. This has been a global problem. And you look at you know folks who monitor democracy around the world. You know, will tell you like over the last you know five to ten years, we've seen you know very poor trend lines um, in lots and lots of countries. Um, you know, for for how uh, democratic they are. And there was a piece I think in the Times just yesterday um, about another one of these uh, figures where where the U.S. is just it is dropped from like 17th to 29th or something like that in the you know sort of how robust our democracy is so i feel like that's a, 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 a an issue that we can we should be able to agree on it's definitely something to organize around and a, a principle that, that can be applied you know broadly to to you know jews here in the us and, and around the world excellent well mick thank you ruth thank you um i greatly appreciate both of you in joining us and writing that article and doing this work uh, reminder for everyone, we, this has been recorded. We will share the recording. We will share the transcript. Um, I greatly appreciate everybody for joining us and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks. 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 Thank you.